want to share the screen. All right. Does everybody see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes, Very sir. good. All right. So if ever when I'm talking, I'm going over stuff and you have a question, you need to unmute and you need to holler at me and ask a question or slow me down or, or whatnot. I know it's kind of difficult with the Zoom uh, meetings, but um, whoops, I hit the wrong button. All right, so just stop me when, when you get confused. Uh, just have your notepad out, take some notes. Um, ideally, it would be nice if you would print the PowerPoints out. Um, and if you print the PowerPoint out, you don't have to, but if you do, you print it out with three slides on the page and it gives you little blanks on the side of the slide you can write notes on. And you can just write your notes on that. But if you don't want, if you don't have a printer, you don't want to waste ink and stuff, you don't have to print them out if you don't want to. All right, so let's just get into it. Um, the heart is located in your thoracic cavity between your lungs. Everybody already knows that. The name of the anatomical position where the heart is located in the thoracic cavity is called the mediastinum. So this is basically an anatomical name for the position where the heart's at. And that area basically lies just uh, deep to the sternum with the sternum has been removed and just anterior to the vertebral column, your backbone back here. So that area is called the mediastinum and the heart is anchored in place in there by something called the pericardium. The pericardium is a sac around the heart. Now you don't have to go and, and focus on this slide. I only left this here so you can see how during development, the heart's developing and then there's a little membrane that starts to wrap around the heart. So we're gonna look at this, not in a developmental sense, but just the layers that make up the heart wall. So ultimately this is called the pericardium. Peri means around by the way, P peri, P-E-R-I. Uh, and cardium is the membrane that's around the heart. So it surrounds the heart. And there are two basic main layers to the pericardium. One of the layers, the outermost layer, is called the fibrous pericardium, right here. Fibrous pericardium. It's made up of basically non-elastic collagen fibers, and it's tough. It doesn't stretch, uh, and it anchors the heart in place. It also prevents the heart from overstretching. So it's anchored from just deep to the sternum, from the uh, posterior part of the sternum, all the way to the anterior part of the vertebral column. Now, just on the inside of this fibrous layer is a doubled membrane system, which is called the serous pericardium. So there's several organs in our body that are surrounded by basically two membranes. That's called just one membrane, but there's two layers to it. It's a doubled membrane. And these are generic names right here, visceral and parietal. The visceral layer of a doubled membrane system is the part of the membrane that lies closest to the organ. And more often than not, that part of the membrane actually lies on the surface of the organ. And then the one that is called parietal is always the part of the membrane that is farthest from the organ. So it's not lying directly on it. Um, these types of membranes are called a serous membrane. The one for the heart is called serous pericardium, because this means the membrane around the heart. But we have other serous membranes, like around your stomach and your intestines and so forth and so on, around your lungs even. So serous membranes are membranes that produce a lubricating fluid. So you can imagine your heart sitting there inside that uh, pericardium and you know it's, it would generate friction but it's lubricated. That lubrication is ba the generic name for that lubrication is called serous fluid. But around the heart and other organs the name the generic name has a specific name. So the serous fluid that we're talking about with the heart is called pericardial fluid. Um, the pericardial fluid is produced by these two layers of the serous pericardium. And I'm going to show you what that is in a minute. 
I put in here just a little animation. We're not gonna learn all of the different uh, layers of cardiac muscle, the atrial swirl and, and ventricular swirl I'll mention, but we're not identifying that. So you can review cardiac muscle. This is some generic information that was ultimately introduced in AMP1. And all through the PowerPoint, I'm sure some of y'all have been looking at them. These animations are pretty good. You have to be connected to the internet to click on them though. All right, so let's look at the heart wall. And this is gonna help you out if you have lab. You have to identify the parts of the heart wall and lab as well. Again, I'm not making you identify them in here, but we still have to know what the layers are. So if we look at, here's a, the right ventricle down here. You see this little box right here. And if we enlarge it and look at uh, the layers of the heart, there are three basic layers to the heart wall. The heart is surrounded by that pericardium though. So starting from inside out, the inner lining of the chambers of the heart is called the endocardium. Endo means within. So the inner lining is called endocardium. The middle layer is the thickest layer of the heart wall, and that's where the muscle tissue is located. It's called the myocardium. The myocardium is composed of cardiac muscle tissue. Remember, there's three different types of tissue, uh, muscle tissue in the body, right? There's skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth muscle. So obviously in this chapter, we're concerned with cardiac muscle, um, how we regulate its contraction and relaxation, um, and the outcome of its contraction and relaxation, which you pretty much already know, is the movement of blood through the cardiovascular system. That's what the heart does. So on the very outer lining of the heart wall is this little this first blue line that you see that the artist drew in, that's called the epicardium. Just like we learned epidermis is above the dermis in AMP1, the epicardium is the outermost layer of the heart wall. But it also has another name. It has the name of the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So remember the serous pericardium is made of two layers. One layer is called visceral and the other layer is called parietal in all serous membranes around the body. So the first layer that lies on the heart wall directly is this first blue line and that's called the epicardium or the visceral serous pericardium. Then you have this little bitty cavity right here. It's called the pericardial cavity and that's where the serous fluid called pericardial fluid is going to be secreted in. So this visceral serous pericardium is going to secrete fluid. And then the second blue line that you see on the picture is called the parietal serous pericardium. Now these two serous layers is nothing more than a simple squamous epithelial sheet that you learned about in AMP1. It's basically simple squamous cells. And that's what serous membranes really are. They're simple squamous epithelial sheets. And they have the job of secreting a slippery fluid, that lubrication. So that's the parietal layer. See how it's not directly attached to the heart? It's the outermost layer. And that's what parietal means. On the outside of that though, you have the dense fibrous layer. That's called the fibrous peri uh, pericardium. This is the non-elastic uh, anchoring of the heart in the mediastinum. All right, so just know a little bit about those layers. I'm not going to make you identify them, but you should know, you know, that the visceral layer is on the heart and the parietal layer is farther away. And both of these layers produce pericardial fluid for lubrication. All right, so let's go through some of the anatomy of the heart. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the anatomy but we have to know some of the terms, we have to know what the chambers are, and we have to know what the major blood vessels are because we have to know the blood flow through the heart. And when we get to the cardiac cycle, we're gonna have to know where blood is coming from and where blood is going to. So ultimately I'm gonna go over a couple of these terms, but we need to try and get into the physiology as quickly as we can. So here is a graphic of the heart, it's an anterior view. If you're looking at the anterior view of the heart, what is on your right side is the left side of the heart. 
And what's on your left side is actually the right side of the heart. Because it's like you're looking at the heart in a person that's standing in front of you or looking at the heart as a person is lying down on a bed in the hospital. All right. So if they're, if they're, if you're standing in front of someone, this would be all the left side and this would be all the right side. Now we have some external landmarks. First of all, where all the great vessels enter and leave the heart up here is called the base. So the bottom is not the base up here is the base. And then down here where it, it kind of, turns into a little point that's always called the apex. There are three major grooves on the heart, which are called a sulcus. The sulcus or groove that runs down the anterior side of the heart is called the anterior interventricular sulcus. The sulcus that runs around the heart in an anterior posterior plane in this fashion is called the coronary sulcus. And the one we can't see on this view is the one that runs down the back or posterior view would be called the posterior interventricular sulcus. Now those indentations are filled with a fat layer, a fat pad, and there's some nerves that run in there and then some major blood vessels for the heart itself, some arteries and some veins uh, for, the heart, for the heart to have its own coronary circulation. So if we're looking at the anterior side of the heart and we see the anterior sulcus, just on the right side of that sulcus is all of the left ventricle down here. Just on the left side is all of the right ventricle. Now, our heart has four chambers, two upper atria. Here's the, would be the right atrium over here. This would be the left atrium over here and two lower ventricles, a right ventricle and a left ventricle. The posterior side of the heart reveals uh, some major vessels that we're gonna talk about. First of all, these vessels right here are called pulmonary veins and the pulmonary veins come from the lungs. So the lungs aren't shown. There are two pulmon major pulmonary veins that come from each lung. So the left lung would be over here. Since we're looking at the back of the heart now, what's on our left is left. What's on our right is right. So these are the left pulmonary veins. These are the right pulmonary veins. And blood from the lungs, freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs, returns back to the heart via the pulmonary veins, as we're going to look at in a minute. Here's the posterior sulcus, the interventricular sulcus on the back. So there's some great vessels that run through there. This would represent, the groove would represent the coronary sulcus. And the, on the posterior side of the heart is where the largest vein is located for the heart. It's actually a specialized vein, it's called a sinus. So this is where all deoxygenated blood accumulates from the heart itself, the coronary sinus. This is the aorta, the largest artery in the body. There's three parts to it. And then there's some branches on it. You're learning some of that in lab already. And we have the superior vena cava right here, one of the two largest veins, and the inferior vena cava right here. And notice that they connect at what's called the right atrium. And so does this coronary sinus. So I'm gonna mention those again in a second. If we look at the frontal section, the anterior view of a frontal section of the heart, that means we just cut off the heart um, in a frontal plane, but we're still looking at the anterior view of it. So what's on our right is the left side of the heart and what's on our left is the right side of the heart. Also notice that the right side of the heart, the artist colored in kind of tinted in blue. The left side of the heart is tinted in red. That's because the right side of the heart only receives and then pumps out deoxygenated blood, all right? The left side of the heart is red because it only receives and then pumps out oxygenated blood. And we're gonna learn the flow of the blood through the heart. So let's look at a couple of, of structures on the heart, dealing with the inside of the heart. First of all, 
And I know I have a couple of pictures of these. I'm gonna just go ahead and teach you everything from the one picture and then just move through the slides and you can you know, read through them later. But here are the chambers of the heart. We have two upper atria. This is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. We have two lower ventricles, the chambers down here. This is the right ventricle. And this is the left ventricle. So each one of these atria are separated from their lower ventricle via a valve. There are four valves in the heart that control the opening and closing to the ventricles. So the valves that separate the atria from a ventricle on either side of the heart are generically called an atrioventricular valve or AV valve. So here's the AV valve on the right side of the heart. It's technically called the tricuspid valve. On the left side of the heart, the AV valve right here is called the bicuspid or the mitral valve. You'll still hear this name uh, on the unit in the cath lab when they're doing imaging or whatnot. There are some disorders of this valve that you might learn about later on. They're called mitral valve stenosis, mitral valve prolapse. It makes a less efficient cardiac function. And I'll mention some of that when we do the cardiac cycle. But nonetheless, this is the tricuspid, this is the bicuspid. Now, the other two valves are separating the artery from the ventricle. So each one of these ventricles has the job of receiving blood from an atrium and then ejecting the blood into its artery. So from the right ventricle, the right ventricle receives blood from the right atrium that blood is then gonna go into its artery, which is called the pulmonary trunk. The left ventricle receives blood from the left atrium, and the left ventricle then has to send blood to its artery, which is the aorta. Now there's three parts to the aorta. The part that goes up is called ascending, because it's going up, and then it arches over, which is lo and behold, called the aortic arch. And then it goes posterior to the heart and then down. That's all called the descending aorta. All right, so let's get into how these valves work. The AV valves, which separate the atria from a ventricle, all have these little chordae tendini. These strings are called chordae tendini. These chordae tendini anchor the flap of a valve to a special muscle that protrudes from the ventricular myocardium. I'll go back and show you a picture of that. It's kind of small to see it right here. But nonetheless, just prior to the ventricle ejecting blood into its artery, the left ventricle to the aorta or the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk. Just prior to that ejection, these papillary muscles contract and pull down on these little chordae tendini, which holds the flap of the valve called a cusp down really tight. It closes the valve because when the ventricle goes to contract, the blood is automatically going to want to go straight back up where it came from. It's, it's going to want to squish back up. So that's what they show in this picture. So the ventricle starts to contract instead of the blood regurgitating back up into the atrium, which would be bad, the valve has to close. And so these papillary muscles close the valve. And when the blood is trying to go back up, it meets a closed valve and the blood is rerouted to a lower pressure area in the heart, which is always up into its artery. And I'm gonna tell you about the pressure changes when we get to the cardiac cycle. All right, so let's go back to this picture for a second. Right here, you see these little bitty muscles that protrude from the ventricular myocardium. 
on the wall of the ventricle. Those are called papillary muscles. When the ventricular myocardium begins to contract, these papillary muscles contract first, which pull down on the cords and shuts the valve off, closes it. Because when the ventricles completely contract, the blood's going to want to go straight back up where it came from, which would, like I said, be bad. You don't want blood regurgitating back where it came from. We only want blood to move in one direction through the heart. And that's why we have these four valves. The sole reason why we have these valves in the heart is to ensure that blood only flows in one direction. So the AV valves prevent blood from going from a ventricle back up into an atrium. But the, these valves, which notice they don't have any cords on them. These are called semilunar valves, this one and that one right there. The semilunar valves have the job of blocking off the entrance from a ventricle to its artery. So when blood is entering the ventricle, these valves are closed because we don't want blood coming from the artery back down into a ventricle. You never want it to go backwards. That's the point of these valves. You only want it to move in a forward direction. So the ventricles will fill with blood at a certain time in a cycle. The AV valve will close, the ventricle contracts, and then the semilunar valves have to open in order for blood to go up into its artery. Yeah. So these semilunar valves, hold on. So I'm not gonna lie, this sorry about that. All right, so these semilunar valves have the job of preventing backflow of blood from their from the artery down to a ventricle. And so the one that blocks off the opening of a ventricle to the pulmonary trunk is always called the pulmonary semilunar valve or just pulmonary valve. The one that blocks off the aorta from the left ventricle is called the aortic semilunar valve or just aortic valve. So these have a generic name. They're called semilunar valves. So we have the pulmonary one and the aortic one. All right, now let's go through the blood flow through the heart. <clears throat> the blood flow through the heart occurs pretty much at the same time on either side of the heart. I'm gonna have to explain that when we get to the cardiac cycle. But the way that you learn the blood flow through the heart is in steps. So we say, okay, blood comes into the right atrium, then to the right ventricle, then through the pulmonary trunk, through the pulmonary arteries and to the lungs. You load the blood with oxygen, when you breathe in and out, you get rid of the CO2, and then blood comes back to the left atrium, and then down to the left ventricle, through the aorta, and back out to the body, so the cells can get the oxygen they need and nutrients they need. So we learn it in steps. However, everything that's happening on the right side of the heart is happening at the same time on the left side of the heart. The two upper atria, and the two lower ventricles alternate between contraction and relaxation, or what we call systole and diastole. For instance, the chambers, either atria or ventricles, the chambers of the heart can only fill with blood when they're relaxing. Let's face it, if the, vent if the chambers are contracting, they're trying to squish blood out, so you can't put blood back into them. So the chambers can only fill when they're in relaxation. So for that reason, both the upper atria, the right one and the left one, receive blood at the same time when they're relaxing. And while they're relaxing, the ventricles are contracting to squish their blood or eject their blood out into their artery. Then the ventricles are relaxing together as they're filling with blood. So the atria go through an alternation of contraction relaxation as do the ventricles. And that's part of the cardiac cycle that we're about to get into. 
But before we do that, let's go through where the blood's moving because we have to know where the blood is coming to and going to and coming from during the cardiac cycle. So I like to start down here at number 10, which is which shows the sources of blood for the right atrium. In other words, where does the right atrium receive its blood from? Well, from these three sources. So the right atrium only receives deoxygenated blood. And that's why this whole area, the right atrium, right ventricle is tinted blue. So the right atrium is receiving blood from the body that the cells already took oxygen out of. So where does it receive that blood from? Well, it receives it from the superior vena cava, which drains blood from all structures above the heart back down to the right atrium. The inferior vena cava, which drains blood from all structures below the heart back up to the right atrium. And then deoxygenated blood from the heart directly. Remember, the heart needs oxygen too. So the, all of the used up blood from the heart, so to speak, drains from the posterior side of the heart ultimately into the right atrium through the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is constantly dumping deoxygenated blood back into the right atrium from the posterior side of the heart. If you remember, I just showed you that picture, but let me go back because I know I went over it kind of quickly. Here's the posterior side of the heart. All of the veins on the heart, oh, they don't show it on there. All of the veins on the heart, all the little blue things you see everywhere on the back and on the front, on the side, everywhere, drains blood into the coronary sinus. And the coronary sinus is constantly draining blood over into the right atrium. The superior vena cava drains blood into the right atrium. The inferior vena cava drains blood into the right atrium. That's all deoxygenated blood. Now the blood, the deoxygenated blood is going to go from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will then contract and pump blood through the pulmonary semilunar valve, which has to open in order for blood to be ejected from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk divides as it goes posterior to the heart into a left and then a right pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery goes to the left lung, which is not shown, it's over here, but the left lung would be over here. And the right pulmonary artery sends blood to the right lung. Then you breathe in and out, you load the blood with oxygen, you remove the CO2, and that freshly oxygenated blood returns from the lungs to the left atrium via four pulmonary veins. Two from the left lung drains oxygenated blood into the left atrium, and two from the right lung drains oxygenated blood into the left atrium. The oxygenated blood from the left atrium goes to the left ventricle through the left AV valve called the bicuspid or mitral valve from the right, I'm sorry, from the left ventricle, blood is gonna go through the aortic semilunar valve, which has to open into the ascending aorta and then into the aortic arch and the descending aorta. So the aorta distributes that freshly oxygenated blood to all of the other arteries in the body that you're learning in lab right now. So in humans, we have three arterial branches off of the aortic arch. I know these aren't labeled. It's not going to be on this test, but since you have it for lab, I'm going to tell you what they are if you don't know them already. The first branch off of the arch is called the brachiocephalic trunk. The middle branch is your left common carotid. And your third branch is the left subclavian artery that goes through your left shoulder and into your arm. So that's those three branches right there. So the left ventricle has a job of ejecting blood into the aorta that then distributes oxygenated blood through all of the arteries to, then to all of the capillary beds in the body where the cells take the oxygen out that they need and they put back in their CO2 that they're making, waste gas. This is the waste gas product of ATP production. 
They also take out their nutrients, sugars, amino acids, all the electrolytes, vitamins, all the stuff that the cells need. They're taking from this blood. And then that deoxygenated blood returns back to the heart via veins. Oh, I guess I should tell you that as well. I did it in the lab. All veins in the body, all of them, return blood back to the heart. All arteries uh, direct blood away from the heart. So that's how we know what veins are and what arteries are. Veins always transport blood to the heart and arteries always transport blood away from the heart. Now, in the systemic circuit, which includes all of the left side of the heart, or at least the left ventricle and Excuse me, I'm not sure what happened, but I lost all volume. Like I did too. I, yeah, me too. Wait, wait, something happened because he stopped too. I think he lost connection, maybe. Okay. Well, we all still here. We just waiting on him. <laughs> Be back. Excuse my. Students, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. What, at what point did y'all lose me? You were talking about where the blood flow flow, like how the veins are in the heart and the arteries were going throughout the body. And you did a little bit after that in the shot. Okay, good. That means you, I, I didn't lose too much of it. So let me go back. And then um, let's see. So I was on this picture that you see right here. Yes. All right, good. So did, did we complete the steps on where the blood moves? On, I think you were on 10. You were about to be finished it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay, so ultimately, okay, so what I said after that, when, when the blood is returning back to the atria from the areas of the body, one side is carrying deoxygenated blood and one side's carrying oxygenated blood. So what I think y'all missed is me defining what veins are and then defining what um see, and then defining what arteries are. So maybe that's what y'all missed. Yeah, you stated all veins return and all arteries take blood away from the heart, and that's where you went out. Okay, good. Then we didn't we didn't uh, miss anything. Then that was the last thing I, I said when I noticed that my internet it said my internet was unstable. So I just plugged my cord directly into that modem. So I shut the house's Wi-Fi off. <laughs> All right. So veins carry blood back to the heart and arteries carry blood away. But um, I also mentioned that systemic veins are colored blue and systemic arteries are colored red. That's because all of the systemic veins are carrying deoxygenated blood and all systemic arteries are carrying oxygenated blood. But the pulmonary circuit is reversed. The arteries of the pulmonary circuit, like the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries are colored blue because they transport oxygen back to the, uh, uh, from the heart to the lungs to get oxygenated. 
And then the pulmonary veins are colored red because they carry oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart. All right, so I think that's where I was, I was leaving off when I got disconnected. So can you all still hear me? Yes, we can. All right, very good. All right, so let's move on from here. Does anybody have any questions about the blood flow through the heart? The main thing here are where's the blood coming from to a ventricle and where the blood is going from the ventricle and through which valves? Because we, this is part of the anatomy we have to cover when we do the, the cardiac cycle. All right, so you don't have to identify these arteries. You, you probably do in the lab, but you should know uh, the four main artery names for the heart. Um, the heart has its own circulation system. It's called the coronary circuit. There are two primary arteries, a right one and a left one. They come off of the ascending aorta. The right coronary artery has two branches and the left coronary artery has two branches. The two branches of the right coronary artery, one of them goes down the right lateral side of the heart, it's called the marginal branch. And the other branch goes down the posterior sulcus on the back. That's called the posterior interventricular branch or the posterior interventricular artery. The left coronary artery branches into a big artery that goes down the anterior sulcus of the heart. So that's the one on the front. It's called the anterior interventricular artery or branch and a branch that goes down the left lateral side of the heart is called the circumflex branch. Now there's three main veins on the heart, although there's more than those three. Uh, the ones I usually teach is the one that goes down the anterior sulcus along with the, uh, the anterior interventricular artery. That's called, that vein is called the great cardiac vein. The one that goes down the posterior sulcus in the back is called the middle cardiac vein. And then the largest of the veins on the heart runs in that coronary sulcus. That's the coronary sinus. So the veins obviously are draining deoxygenated blood from the heart itself, ultimately back to the right atrium. That's what the coronary veins are doing. The coronary arteries are supplying freshly oxygenated blood to all parts of the heart. All right, now we have to go into the cardiac cycle. I mean, I'm sorry, the conduction system of the heart and learn what the conduction system does. So ultimately you can sever every nerve that goes to the heart and the heart is still gonna beat on its own. So I mentioned this in lab, if you're not in lab, I'm gonna just tell you that that does happen every time somebody gets a heart transplant, they got to sever all the nerves to it. So, but the heart still works on its own. So why is that? Well, the heart works on its own because the cardiac muscle cells are autorhythmic, which means they're self excitable. So we, we do not have to rely on the nervous system for neurons firing to the heart to make it work. And ultimately, it's because of what we call the pacemaker and the conduction system. So the heart has its own little nervous system, so to speak. I hate saying it that way, but um, ultimately, the pacemaker, everybody knows the heart has a pacemaker. And then there's uh, parts that are called the conduction system. The pacemaker cells produce spontaneously electrical impulses at a certain rate. And those electrical impulses are generated because of something called a pacemaker potential. So a pacemaker potential is a change in the resting membrane potential automatically. And it's due to the fact that the ion channels in these cells are a little bit different than the ion channels in other muscle tissue in the body and other cells in the body. And so what that means, what I mean to say by that is these ion channels will open and close and open and close rhythmically on their own. Um, and I usually like to describe those types of channels. Like if you ever go to a, a big building and they got those doors 
that kind of keeps circling, open and close, open and close, open and close, and you got to walk between them to get in or out. That's sort of what these channels are like. So as the channel is opening, 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 ions move in, and we're gaining sodium and calcium here. And if you gain sodium and calcium, then you become more positive, and you make it to what's called a threshold value. And that threshold value is where voltage-gated sodium and calcium channels open. And it causes an influx of sodium and calcium and the muscle cells depolarize. And that's what this upward deflection is. So this depolarization phase right here causes, um, in a, not in the pacemaker, but in the cardiac contractile fiber, it causes it to contract. So this is the pacemaker potential its role is to make the membrane potential become more positive so we can fire off an action potential. And it's the action potential that will then propagate through the conduction system, all through the heart. And that action potential then causes muscle contraction in the heart. And I'm gonna describe that to you. So let's go over what the pacemaker is and what the conduction system is. So I know you heard of pacemaker. Well, it has a name. It's called the sinoatrial node or SA node. Each part of this system though, the conduction system can spontaneously generate electrical impulses or action potentials. But the SA node produces those action potentials the fastest. So that's why it's called the pacemaker. It overrides the rest of the system. So the SA node fires, it sends the action potential through all of the atrial muscle cells. Up here is where the atrial muscle swirl would be and ultimately causes atrial depolarization and contraction. That action potential reaches the AV node, the next part of the conduction system. It's called the atrioventricular node. The AV node collects the action potential and sends it down through what's called an AV bundle. The AV bundle is the only electrical connection between the upper atria and the lower ventricles. So if there's an, an electrical conduction problem through the AV bundle, then a person has what's called a heart block. There's three different degrees of heart block. The worst one is a third degree. I'm not gonna put that on a test. It's a little bit beyond the scope of, of this lecture to go into that, but some of y'all might've heard of a heart block before. And heart blocks are very noticeable on the EKG. And I'll, I might mention it briefly when we do the EKG in a second. But nonetheless, the electrical potential goes from the atria to the AV node through the AV bundle. Now the AV bundle splits into what are called bundle branches. There's a left one that goes to the left side of the heart ventricles and a right one that goes to the right ventricle. These branches go down this septum inside the heart. This is called the interventricular septum, which separates the right and left ventricles from one another. The bundle branches go towards the apex and then up through the myocardium of the ventricle as what's called Purkinje fibers. So as the uh, Electrical potential goes up through the Purkinje fibers, the action potential, it depolarizes all of the ventricular myocardial cells and, and makes them contract. So it's the production of the electrical impulse and the propagation of the electrical impulses that causes the muscle tissue to contract. So I'll put here a little animation for the cardiac conduction system. You should review that. Actually, there's two of them. One's 3D physiology. The other one is just a, a simple animation. But what we need to talk about is the EKG and what depolarization and repolarization is and what causes that. Because on the test, I'm going to have a couple of questions on ion channels. So what you're looking at right here, this graph, is what we call the electrical cycle of the heart. Basically, it's a modified version of what you learned in AMP1 in chapter 10, 
where we have depolarization, where the membrane potential of the muscle cell goes up to a more positive value. And at least in skeletal muscle, the picture looked like a point because this red line over here came straight back down. So we depolarize skeletal muscle, it repolarizes right away. Cardiac muscle is totally different. Cardiac muscle tissue goes through a, deep, a rapid depolarization, and then it stays depolarized for a prolonged period of time, which is very important. And then it becomes more negative again, which is called a repolarization. So depolarization means the membrane potential becomes positive. A repolarization means the membrane potential becomes more negative. So we need to learn what the ion channels are that cause the change in this potential. So let me tell you what this potential change is right here. Again, some people don't remember electrophysiology and I don't blame you. But if you stuck two electrodes on the surface, uh, on the membrane of a cell, one is on the surface and one pokes into the cytoplasm actually. And if every single ion channel is closed, meaning no ions are moving across the membrane, you would record a straight line at, at some value. The value is not even that important, but at some value, you would record a straight line. That straight line that you're recording, and for skeletal uh, cardiac muscle cells, it's a minus 90, by the way. That's why it's right here. Skeletal muscle cells are around a 70 up here, uh, and some neurons are up here. But nonetheless, you would record a straight line. Now, if you open ion channels and, and allow ions to move across the membrane, depending on what their charge is and what direction the ions move, you can make that straight line have deviations in it, meaning you could record a line that goes up or you can record a line that goes down. So what would cause the line to become more positive? Well, you would have to gain positive charges. If you gain positive charges, you become positive. If you lose positive charges, you become negative. So this is physiology 101 again. If you ever, well, when you open any sodium channel on any membrane in the body, on any cell in the body, sodium always moves to the inside of the cell and sodium is positively charged. If you open a calcium channel at the cell surface, calcium always moves to the inside of the cell and calcium is positively charged. If you open a potassium channel, Potassium always moves out of the cell and it's positively charged. So in other words, if you open a sodium channel, you're gonna gain positive, so you become positive. If you open a calcium channel, you're gonna gain positives, so you stay positive. And if you open a potassium channel, you're gonna lose your potassium, which is positively charged. And if you lose your positives, you become negative. So on the test, I want you to know what causes rapid depolarization, which is the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. So voltage-gated sodium channels open, and you gain sodium very quickly, you become positive. That's called depol rapid depolarization. In cardiac muscle, we stay depolarized for a prolonged period of time. That's called the plateau phase. And that's caused by the opening of voltage-gated, slow calcium channels. They're called slow because the calcium channels are slow to open, but they're slow to close as well. Now, this is the part that does not happen in skeletal muscle. And the reason why the plateau phase is so important is because it prevents your heart from contracting too quickly and thus prevents your heart from going into a Charlie horse. And that's an easy way to explain it. You guys know what a Charlie horse is, I'm sure. Your skeletal muscles contract, they lock up, they don't relax. We call it a Charlie horse. 
Well, a Charlie horse is technically called tetany. So our heart does not go into tetany unless something is seriously wrong. Because under normal conditions, th during this time right here, we have what's called a refractory period. Notice it extends the whole length of the plateau phase and just into repolarization. It is during this amount of time that the heart cannot contract again, which means the heart has to repolarize and then relax before it can contract again. So the heart won't contract and just stay contracted. Because let's face it, if your heart was contracted and just stayed contracted, it's not pumping blood and you're dying. So this plateau phase, which is induced by the influx of calcium, helps maintain the plateau phase, a prolonged depolarization, and helps increase the refractory period. Notice the refractory period is just under 300 milliseconds, which is 0.3 seconds, 300 milliseconds. That's a long time, relatively long time, compared to something like skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle refractory period is only between 5 and 15 milliseconds. That's a lot faster than you can even snap your finger. So for that reason, our skeletal muscles, can, they can contract without relaxing and they lock up, which hurts. We don't really like that, but it can happen. All right. So know which ion channels open to cause these different phases of the electrical cycle. Uh, the opening of voltage-gated potassium channels causes repolarization. And potassium leaves the cell. That's why we lose positives, we become negative. Now, during rapid depolarization and the plateau phase, that's during the time when the, the, the chambers are contracting. We have to repolarize those cardiac muscle cells. And just after repolarization, the chambers will go into relaxation. All right, so we're about to get into the cardiac cycle, but before we do that, we need to know what the EKG represents. So the EKG is a tracing, a graph, a tracing of the electrical activity of the heart. So what happens electrically on our heart can be recorded in what we call the electrocardiogram. The electrocardiogram has specific waves or deflections from a baseline. So those waves or deflections are looked at by doctors. The cardiologist will look at an EKG and say, okay, are all of the normal waves present? Because sometimes there's an abnormal wave. For that matter, if all of the normal waves are present, are the amplitude of their deviations normal? Meaning, if you don't know what amplitude is, it's the height of a wave. So is the height of the wave normal or is it lower than normal or is it bigger than normal? That all means something to the doctor, something that could be wrong with the heart. So are all the normal waves present? Are they the right size? That's number one. The other thing we see on the EKG are time periods, segments and time periods, the intervals. And so the doctor will look at these intervals and see if the time periods are correct. Because look down here. At rest, in an average normal healthy individual, a cardiac cycle lasts 800 milliseconds, which is 0.8 seconds. There's a thousand milliseconds in one second. So this, these tracings that we see here represents one complete cardiac cycle. All of the events that happen in one heartbeat is called the cardiac cycle, by the way. So let's go through the waves. Bare minimum on the test, I'm gonna have a couple of questions about what the waves represent. And I'm about to tell you what they represent. We do not have to identify the waves in here, that's for lab. But nonetheless, the P wave, let's start with the first wave. This is a, a typical type two lead, by the way. So this P wave right here represents the fact that the pacemaker just fired. As soon as the pacemaker fires, boom, 
and you have somebody with the leads on, you would record the P wave. So the P wave represents the fact that their pacemaker is working because it just fired. But the P wave also represents the fact that the atria depolarized and then subsequently contracted. So you have to remember, in order for the chambers to contract, they have to depolarize first. So that the P wave represents SA nodal firing and that the atria depolarized and then subsequently contract. That's what's important about that. Now the QRS complex is a series of three waves. It's called the complex. There's a Q wave, R wave, and S wave. The QRS complex represents the fact that the ventricles are depolarized and then they contract. So just after depolarization, the chambers will contract. Now look at this ST segment. This ST segment is a segment. Obviously it starts at the end of the S wave and just at the beginning of the, what's called the T wave. It's called the ST segment. So this ST segment corresponds to the electrical time period, which is referred to as the plateau phase. So during this plateau phase is when the ventricles are completely depolarized and they are contracting. And so that's what the ST segment's representing for us. So the ventricles begin to depolarize and around midway, two thirds of the way through the QRS complex, they start to contract. They stay contracted through the ST segment and just into the T wave. Now the T wave is being recorded because the ventricles are repolarizing. So as the ventricles are repolarizing, just thereafter about midway to two thirds of the way through the T wave, they relax. And from that point, all the way to the next firing of the ST, a node for the next cycle, we would then start all over. We would get a new P wave, you would get a QRS complex and T wave. So on the test, I just want you to know what the waves represent. The P wave is atrial depolarization and contraction. The QRS is ventricular depolarization and subsequent contraction. The ST segment represents the plateau phase of contraction of the ventricles. And that T wave represents repolarization and subsequent relaxation of the ventricles. That's about all I want you to know for that. I know there's a little bit more information in there, but just know that and you'll be fine, all right? All right, let's talk about the cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle involves all events that occur during one heartbeat. All of the electrical events that we just went over, depolarization, repolarization, which is going to induce contraction and relaxation of the chambers. And when we contract and relax the muscles around the chambers, we're going to generate pressure differences in the heart. It's the pressure differences in the heart and in the cardiovascular system, for that matter, that drives blood flow. Blood can only ever move down a pressure gradient from high to low pressure. So in order to get blood to move through the heart in the direction that we were talking about up here, from the right atrium to the right ventricle, through the pulmonary trunk, back, all of this, the blood can only move in one direction through the heart if there are pressure gradients that favor that movement. Now, while I'm on this picture, I will say this. The cardiac cycle involves a relaxation and a contraction period for all the chambers. The relaxation period is called diastole, with a D, diastole. And the contraction phase is called systole. So the two upper atria go through systole together. And when they are in systole, they pump blood down to their ventricle at the same time. 
Now, both atria then go into diastole. And while the atria are in diastole, the ventricles contract at the same time. Both the right and the left ventricles will contract at the same time. And they both then try to eject their blood at the same time into their respective artery. So while the atria are contracting, the ventricles are relaxed and trying to fill with blood. While the ventricles are contracting, the atria are relaxed and they're trying to fill with blood. So we have an alternation between contraction and relaxation for the atria and the ventricles. They alternate between contraction and relaxation. So I have a couple of animations in here. You need, to, you need to really review those because it talks about what you see on this picture. And this is a picture that a lot of students really don't like because there's so much information on it. But I'm gonna tell you exactly what we need to know off of this picture and describe the main events that occur during the cardiac cycle. So can everybody still hear me? Yes. 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 All right, yes. very good. All right, so I know this chart, if you haven't looked at it yet in your book, is kind of intimidating because there's several different graphs on this thing all over the place. But the information that we get from this chart is not really that difficult if you break it down correctly, all right? So first of all, I'm gonna show you the areas on here that are important. One area that's important is the, is the EKG. We have to know what is happening electrically with the conduction system to know what phase of the cardiac cycle we're in. And the good thing about the chart is are the phases are color coordinated. For instance, all of this, whatever color this is, uh, kind of a pinkish or a brownish, I don't know. This color, this color line right here, this is when the atria are contracting. The left and right atrium contract together. And so that's called atrial systole. I wish they would have put the real name right there. Atrial systole or atrial contraction. Now, while the atria are contracting, the ventricles, if you remember, have to be relaxed. So the ventricles are relaxed during this time and they're trying to fill with blood. But then all of a sudden, the ventricles go into contraction. All of the purple is called ventricular systole or ventricular contraction. And notice it's separated into these two little areas. These are the most, these, these are the most important little areas of the cycle right here in the middle. These three little boxes right here at the bottom. So all of the purple is when the ventricles are contracting and then the ventricles go into relaxation. All of the blue represents re the relaxation period. So remember again, all of the chambers can only fill with blood if they're relaxed. If they're trying to contract, you can't put any more blood into them. So during this relaxation period right here, all of the chambers in the heart are relaxed. And so from this, the edge of the purple right here, which is the end of ventricular systole, this is when the ventricles are gonna stop contracting right here. And they go into the blue section that then they're in relaxation. But the ventricles are also relaxed all the way through into the next cycle into when the atria contract again. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at the EKG. The P wave fires, I mean, the SA node fires and we record the P wave. So remember the P wave represents atrial depolarization and contraction. So just after we record the P wave, lo and behold, we get this first section is called atrial contraction or systole. So during this time period, atrial systole, the ventricles are still relaxed and we're gonna put some blood into the ventricle. Now you look up here at the EKG, the QRS complex hits. So about two thirds of the way through the QRS complex, we get ventricular contraction, which is all of the purple. Then we get the T wave and just thereafter, the ventricles are repolarized and then they relax again. So that's how we read the, the EKG. Now, the important areas besides the EKG, knowing what happens in the cycle 
are only two charts. We're not going to deal with the heart sounds right now. Everybody knows your heart goes loved up, loved up, loved up, loved up. That's the closure of the valves in the heart. That's the sounds that you hear when you auscultate somebody's heart. But the areas that I'm interested in are these. This box right here in the middle, very important. These tracings represent the changes in pressure in three different areas of the heart and artery. So these are pressure changes that occur during the cardiac cycle. The last chart that's vitally important is the one down here. This represents the volume changes of a ventricle. So we can see when the, when the ventricle is gaining blood and the volume goes up, or we can see when the, the ventricles lose blood and the volume goes down. This is where we need to know where the blood's coming from and going to that I was mentioning before. So let me describe to you these pressure differences. First of all, the blue line represents the pressure in a ventricle. So you see the pressure in a ventricle is kind of low here, but all of a sudden, boom, right there, the pressure of the ventricle goes up and then it comes back down. So the blue line is the ventricular pressure. The green line is the pressure in the atria. So the pressure in the atria recorded by the green line you see here. The red line represents the pressure in the aorta because these pressure changes that we're looking at up here are for the left side of the heart. And the tracings for the right side of the heart would look exactly the same except the pressure values are much lower, more down here for the right side of the heart. The pressures for the right side of the heart in the pulmonary circuit are much lower than the left side of the heart because the left ventricle has to pump blood around your whole body and back to the heart. So it has to generate more force, more pressure. So what you're looking at here is all for the left side of the heart, but all of the tracings would look exactly the same for both sides of the heart. So let's go over what's going on here, all right? So first of all, I like to start in the middle of the chart where we have what's called ventricular filling. Notice right here, this is a volume of blood in a ventricle over here, for this chart. Notice right here, the ventricle just finished contracting and thus it ejected its blood out. So its blood went to an artery, into an artery. And since this is the left side of the heart, it went into the aorta. But all of a sudden, the ventricle starts to relax. And when the ventricle relaxes, it's going to try and fill up with blood again. However, notice this little bitty area between these two lines right here. The volume of blood doesn't change. It stays the same. This area right here is one of two most important areas of the cardiac cycle. This is a time period during which all four valves in the heart are closed. Just after the ventricles contract, they try to relax, but all four valves in the heart are closed and no, there's no change in blood volume. And since there's no change in blood volume, which is called isovolumetric. Iso means the same, volume, volume. So the isovolumetric area of the cardiac cycle that occurs during relaxation is called isovolumetric relaxation. Now the reason why I'm telling you this is important is because look what happens right there. The blood volume changes. So if just prior to that, we see no blood volume change because all of the valves are closed, but all of a sudden, we see that the ventricle gains blood right here. That means some valves had to open. So who can unmute and tell me where blood comes from that the ventricles gain? Anybody? Where, where do the ventricles get their blood from? Aorta. 
from the atria, not from the aorta. It was a good guess because it, it, it's connected to it, but the blood doesn't come from their artery. The blood that the ventricles are filling up with always come from their atrium. Let me go back to this picture. That's where the blood flow picture comes into play to help you out. So right now, what I am talking about, the ventricles, just prior to them gaining blood, all four of these valves are closed. And if all the valves are closed, that means there's going to be no change in blood volume in either ventricle. But all of a sudden, at that one little spot, the ventricles begin to gain blood. Where's the blood come from? Their atrium. And so you know what it means when we see that blood volume lines start to go up, it means these two valves right here open. The AV valves open to allow blood to come into a ventricle at the end of isovolumetric relaxation, right there. I know the AV valves open right there because the ventricles are gaining blood, right? Now, when the ventricles gain blood, obviously they're relaxing. They got to be relaxed. This is called ventricular filling. There's three phases to ventricular filling. There's something called rapid ventricular filling immediately when the AV valves open right there. The ventr ventricles gain blood, boom. And what's interesting about that, the ventricles just gained a whole bunch of blood, but look what didn't happen. The atria haven't even contracted yet. All that happened was the AV valves opened and blood came down from their upper atria to a lower ventricle, but the atria are still relaxed. That's kind of interesting. So the ventricles actually gain the majority of their blood during rapid ventricular filling without the atria even contracting yet. And for that reason, when somebody has a, a pacemaker that goes out, they don't die right away. Just because their pacemaker goes out and their atria can't contract, their ventricles can still gain some blood to pump back out. So that's why that's important. So this is called rapid ventricular filling. And then you can see we have little to no change. That's called uh, diastasis right here. And then all of a sudden you look at the top, the P wave hit. There's the P wave atrial depolarization, and then contraction. So for this little bit of time, the atria contracted and squished a little bit of blood down to the ventricle. About 25 mils or so go, you know, with atrial contraction. And so then this is the time period when the ventricles are filling with blood. And thus the ventricles are relaxed all the way until we get to the end of atrial systole or the end of what's called the end of ventricular diastole. So I want to go from this line right here to this line right there. So before I move forward, I know I'm going over a little bit. If anybody has another class that you have to go into, you can leave the meeting and just view the recording later. I want to move on a little bit more before I stop the recording so that we will be able to finish up on Tuesday morning and have time for questions. Um, and if you do have to leave the room and you have questions, just email me. But our test, our unit one test on 18 and 20 will stay open through Tuesday night next week. I know on the, on the outline it says the Monday the 15th, but I'm going to make it due on the 16th. All right, so if you have to leave, I understand, but I want to kind of get through the rest of this real quick. So this line right here is this line. So this line right here at the end of atrial systole, from this line on, the atria are gonna relax until the next cycle. And thus they're gonna be filling with blood. But at this line right here, this is when the QRS complex hits and then the ventricles begin to contract. So notice right there, there's a double line again. This is this, the other most important area of the cardiac cycle. There's the ventricles are trying to contract to eject their blood out, but there's no change in blood volume. That's called isovolumetric contraction. 
So during isovolumetric contraction, all four valves in the heart are closed. The ventricles are sitting there trying to squeeze on the blood, contract, and it's trying to eject their blood into their artery. So they're trying to get the blood to go into their artery, except the semilunar valves are closed. For that matter, the AV valves are closed as well. So the ventricles are contracting, but all the valves are closed. And since the blood can't go anywhere, there is an increase in pressure built up in the chamber. And that increase in pressure is reflected as the blue line goes up right here. So during isovolumetric contraction, the single most important event that occurs is an increase in ventricular pressure just above the pressure in the ventricle's artery, which in this case is the aorta because this is the left side of the heart. As soon as the pressure in the ventricle rises above the pressure in its artery, the semilunar valves open right there. And the second that the semilunar valves open, blood is ejected from the ventricle into the artery, which is presented by a drop of ventricular volume right here. So where does blood go when it leaves the ventricle? Well, one place, it goes into its artery. But before the blood can be ejected into its artery, the semilunar valves have to open. Now, the semilunar valves will not open until the pressure in the ventricle rises above the pressure that is in its artery pushing back against the semilunar valve. So the pressure of the blood that pushes back from the artery, pushes back on the semilunar valve, is called the afterload. And that afterload is the bottom number of your blood pressure. So the ventricle has to generate a force that is higher than the back pressure against this valve in order to get this valve to open and for blood to be ejected into its artery. So I know that the ventricle has the semilunar valves open right there because I see a decrease in ventricular volume. And I know that the pressure in the ventricle is higher than the pressure in its artery because the semilunar valves can only open when the ventricular pressure is high. So again, the single most important event that occurs in isovolumetric contraction is an increase in ventricular pressure above its artery pressure so that the semilunar valves will open and we get what's called ventricular ejection. The single most important event that occurs in isovolumetric relaxation is a drop in ventricular pressure just below atrial pressure. The second that the ventricular pressure drops below atrial pressure, the AV valves open and thus the ventricles begin to fill with blood again. So if I go back to that picture again, during isovolumetric relaxation, as soon as the pressure in a lower ventricle drops below the pressure in the upper atria, the AV valves will open and blood will go into a ventricle, which is indicative of an increase in ventricular volume during ventricular filling. So the AV valves open just after isovolumetric relaxation and the semilunar valves open just after isovolumetric contraction. And so why do we have these isovolumetric areas, contraction and relaxation? To change the pressure in a ventricle, that's why. So isovolumetric contraction, ventricular pressure rises above aortic pressure in the left side, and isovolumetric relaxation, ventricular pressure drops below atrial pressure. 
And it's the change in these pressures that causes for the opening and closing of the semilunar valves. Over here, the semilunar valves open and we get ventricular ejection. And right here, the AV valves open and we get ventricular filling. Now, ultimately, I'm gonna have a couple of questions on when these events occur when the valves open. So I need you to look at that. But next week, we're gonna finish up the chapter with cardiac output. And before I, I close the meeting for today, I need to tell you what these values are and just introduce it so we, we have enough time to finish it. Look at where the volume line stops for ventricular filling. The ventricles stop filling with blood at the end of their relaxation period. Remember, all of the purple represents ventricular contraction or systole. So at the end of ventricular relaxation, which is called diastole, there is a total blood volume in the ventricle that we will have available to pump out. And that's it. Because as soon as the ventricles begin to contract, you cannot put any more blood into the ventricle. So this volume right here at the end of what's called ventricular diastole, that volume has a name. It's called the EDV, the end, the EDV is called the end diastolic volume. That is the total blood volume available in a ventricle to be pumped out. Because let's face it, again, as soon as the ventricle begins to contract, you cannot put any more blood in the ventricle. So however much you put in right there is all you have to pump out. That's it. So that's why the EDV is important. That's a total blood volume available to be ejected out. Now also notice at the end of the purple area, ventricular contraction or ventricular systole, the volume in the ventricle, the blood in the ventricle is not zero. Look where it's at, it's around 50 or 60. This would be at rest, by the way, while you're sitting down or you're lying down, you're not physically active. So in other words, when your ventricle contracts and stops, it ejected some blood out on that heartbeat, but it didn't eject all of the blood out that it had in it. So there's a small amount of blood volume left in the ventricle even after the ventricle completed this contraction phase. So that volume of blood's important. It's called the ESV, the end systolic volume. Now the reason why these blood volumes are important is because if you take the volume of blood in a ventricle that you start with, the EDV, and you subtract from that the volume of blood in a ventricle after the ventricle has completed contraction, you can calculate then the volume of blood, which is this line, that the ventricle ejected out on one beat. So what is the blood volume that is ejected from a ventricle on one beat? It's called the stroke volume. So the stroke volume is nothing more than the difference from, between the end diastolic volume, the EDV, and the ESV, the end systolic volume, which brings us to cardiac output. Cardiac output is a diagnostic measurement of the efficiency of a person's heart. And it is the volume of blood that is ejected from the heart every minute. So how much blood do the ventricles eject from the heart every single minute is important. It's called the cardiac output, the CO. The cardiac output changes depending on if you're lying down and you're not active to when you become physically active or you're riding a bike or you're running on a treadmill or whatever you're doing, when you're active, your cardiac output has to increase to support the increased blood needs of your muscles that are working out. And then the cardiac output goes down 
when you're physically inactive. So we have to learn some parameters next Tuesday that changes cardiac output. But for now, we need to look at what contributes to cardiac output. How do we calculate how much blood the heart pumps out every minute? Well, we have to know two things, only two things. We have to know how much blood the heart pumps out every beat. And then we have to know how many times a minute the heart beats, which is heart rate. So if you know how many times a minute your heart is beating, and you know how much blood the heart is pumping out on each beat, all you have to do is multiply them together to get the volume of blood per minute. So look at this multiplication. When we multiply the stroke volume times the heart rate, beats cancel out and you're left with milliliters per minute. And that's a unit of cardiac output. So I'll just tell you that at rest, in a normal healthy individual, your heart pumps out your total blood volume in one minute while you're lying down on the couch. And your total blood volume for females range between four to five liters and males comparably sized five to six liters. It changes depending on your, your body size as well and the different conditions in your body and what's going on. But nonetheless, your heart will pump out your total blood volume in one minute at rest. Now, if you're vigorously working out, your heart increases cardiac output up to four to five times. Meaning when you're vigorously working out, your heart can pump out four to five times your blood volume in one minute. Why is that possible? Because when you're at rest, your ventricles don't eject out all of your blood. But when you're physically working out and you're vigorously working out, <coughs> excuse me, your ventricles are going to contract harder than normal. And the amount of blood that is left in the heart in the ventricle goes down. So we can start tapping into this volume. This volume at rest that's left in the ventricle is called our cardiac reserve. And when we're vigorously working out, the ESV actually goes down and the EDV actually goes up. So if, if the EDV goes up and that number's higher and the ESV goes down and that number's lower, the difference is greater. Everybody could probably see that, which means on one beat, you're going to be ejecting more blood out when you're working out than if you're lying on the couch. And that's some parameters that we have to talk about. So I want you guys to review these videos and animations. We're gonna get into the factors that affect stroke volume. Uh, we're gonna deal with heart rate and we're gonna go over a couple more charts and then we're gonna be done with the chapter. And hopefully that'll give us enough time that, for you to ask questions. If for, for some reason you need to take, you can't take your test on Tuesday because you have to work, you're gonna to have to take it Monday which means you're gonna to have to finish these last few slides on your own and go through my notes in order for you to take the test because we have to have it done by Tuesday, all right? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing a screen here. We're gonna pick back up with stroke volume and cardiac output next time. If any of you guys have any questions. I wanted to say I'm here, um, Ashley. Hi, Smydra, how you doing? Yeah, I was. A I didn't realize today was Thursday. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm. I'm I, I have you marked here actually because you were the first person I marked for lab yesterday, and I had the wrong sheet. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, you're you're good. All right, so if you guys don't have any any questions, um, you can leave the meeting, uh, and I'll post the link to this meeting as soon as Zoom emails it to me, and um, I'll see you guys. Uh, next Tuesday. Some of y'all on Monday. All right. Thank you.